The Metal Gear series is described as tactical espionage action games. While often compared to Splinter Cell and Hitman series, Metal Gear boasts some key elements that differ itself vastly from other franchises. Metal Gear is typically credited for popularizing stealth game genres and is beloved not only for its complex and intricate storyline, but for its innovative and fun gameplay as well. This Konami published franchise makes its first appearance to gamers in the year 1987 with Metal Gear and is developed by the legendary Hideo Kojima. The games within this series are often ranked by multiple publications as some of the greatest games in history. The series takes place in an alternate timeline or universe of our own, as the locations and large events are synonymous with ours, but are expanded upon drastically. Although, due to the highly secret nature of the missions and events in Metal Gear, some fans have speculated extreme theories that allow the series to exist within our world. The story timeline ranges from 1964 to 2014, encompassing the military and war events around those times. As for characters, the games are mostly focused on Solid Snake and the special ops missions he's sent on. Voiced by David Hayter, Solid Snake is renowned as the world's foremost expert in infiltration and stealth. This is not only displayed, but felt through the impressive controls and mechanics made available to the player in each of the games. In addition to an impressive story and gameplay, it is the incredible fourth wall interactions that Kojima places into each of these games that makes gamers such fanatics for this franchise. As we make our way through the series, we'll discuss the time frame each game was released in and compare it to the other games of that year. This is to give an idea of how advanced aspects of each game were given the technology available at the time. We'll also take time to discuss where Kojima was from a career standpoint throughout the series in hopes to give light to how this affected the content in each title. But most importantly, we will cover in detail the real world events that took place between Metal Gear Solid 4 and Metal Gear Solid 5, as this is what we will refer to as the Kojima Konami story. The depressing tale of how Metal Gear went out with a whimper and not a bang. That leads us with the end of the introduction and leading us to determining what games we will be playing in the Metal Gear series. For this history of gaming, we have to figure out how we're going to tackle that kind of a monster of a franchise. I look at the history of gaming series for their impact on how that series of games impacted the industry as a whole. Whether or not a game has an impact in the history, in my eyes, can be derived from any combination of the following elements. Those following elements are Gameplay, Story, Media Influence, and Market Strategy. To define this, gameplay is, of course, just gameplay. Uh, what was innovative or impactful in some way to the consumers or the industry? What design decisions made waves? For the story, that's quite obvious. So was it a powerful enough story to get people talking? And for the uh, industry to kind of follow suit and realize that Narratives are okay to have in video games. I also have media influence. This is a little bit more lenient, but I'm referring to journalistic and social and any other kind of media that puts the game on the map. Was there drama surrounding the title? Did it make some waves? Did people do reports on this and the actual news versus just gaming websites? Things like this. And then market strategy. Uh, while it usually is not what causes a game to make the history of gaming list, it is very important because some games are only existent within the history of gaming series because of how they were marketed. Was there something clever or ingenious that a publisher did, or a developer, or a marketing team that made the game greater and more popular than it may have been if it had just been left to stand on its story and gameplay alone? Was there a market strategy that made an already amazing game even better? Or was there a market strategy that absolutely ruined the franchise before it ever had a chance to come out? We'll see. With these elements in mind, I've painstakingly gone through the entire catalog of every solitary entry into the Metal Gear franchise and researched them fully. If any title has an impact on the game of its in-game or out-of-game story, 
as a whole, no matter how small that may be, it is included in this playthrough. But there are a lot of non-impactful or disregarded by the fans entries in this franchise. These will not receive play as though they either detract from the focus of what is Metal Gear or contain nothing of weight that falls into the previously mentioned four elements. With that said, I'll go ahead and share with you now the Metal Gear series. We will be playing through this series in the following order. Metal Gear originally launched in 1987. Metal Gear Solid or Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake originally released in 1990, and then we will take a review of Metal Gear Solid released for the PlayStation 1 in 1998, just to show you the controls and graphics, and then we will quickly move on to Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. The reason being is Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes released in 2004 for the Nintendo GameCube is a retelling of Metal Gear Solid 1 on the PlayStation 1, directed by Hideo Kojima, published, developed, excuse me, by Silicon Knights, and it has superior controls, 3D animation, uh, that is not in anywhere comparable to what is a Metal Gear Solid 1 on the PlayStation 1. It's just a better version of the game. It's more entertaining to watch, a lot more fun to enjoy. But we'll definitely review Metal Gear Solid 1 on the PlayStation 1 so that you understand what the graphics looked like at the time, what was so innovative about the game, and then we'll play the superior version. We'll move on to Metal Gear Solid 2, and then, of course, Metal Gear Solid 3. The two of these games will be playing the HD re-release versions of this on the PlayStation 3, which is also re referencing to re-releases of both Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 as Substance and Subsistence. I'll get into greater detail when we reach those games about what is Substance and Subsistence, but they're basically just re-released with a lot of extra content versions of those two games. We will then actually sit down and play Metal Gear Acid 1 and 2. These are P PSP games that boast a collectible card game combat system. Um, the reason why I am including these two games, while a lot of people consider them to not be canon, is the reason is, is their story doesn't have to not be canon. The story very well can be included into the overall arcing storyline of what is Metal Gear. And what I like about it is the story of Solid Snake in all these games is about the big important missions that changed the world that Solid Snake was part of. Not the other miscellaneous missions that add to the legend that is Solid Snake. And I believe Metal Gear Acid 1 and 2, while 1 being very fun, addictive gameplay, also shows kind of that miscellaneous mission uh, background that he goes on. Uh, we then move to Metal Gear Portable Ops, which is another PSP game. Again, more history, more background into Solid Snake. Well, it's not Solid Snake, and we'll get to the reason why it's not. But you'll see that at the time. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, we'll move on to, which is the PlayStation 3 title uh, that truly ends the series as far as the chronological timeline of events. We then move to Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Again, another PSP title. And then we move to Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. And then we finish up the series with the comboed title, Metal Gear Solid V, Ground Zeroes, and Phantom Pain. Uh, those last three titles will be played on the PC. What I think is very interesting is this is a total of 14 games, 12 of which have received Metacritic scores. So it's worth coming out on a limb and saying the 12, the last 12, Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2, too early for Metacritic scores to really be a thing then. The last 12 of those games have an aggregate combined score of 87.41 on Metacritic. That is substantial. To say that the worst game out of this entire series got a 75, and the rest of them scoring mostly over 90% on Metacritic. That, if you're not familiar with Metacritic, that means that takes every publication that rated the game ever and combines them into an average on a 100 point scale. It is widely accepted that these games are legendary. 87.1 for 87.41 for 12 games. Now these will be the games we'll be playing. Of course there's some games that we won't be playing, some honorable mentions. The following list and is a list of games and not so games that will be not part of the main focus of the history of gaming Metal Gear playthrough. 
Uh, most of what's listed here does not contain significant story, gameplay mechanics, or impacts into how the series was shaped or developed. Also included in this list is one collection that I would like to point out to folks, as it is uh, an awesome way to get into the series if you're wanting to play it yourself. And these are the honorable mentions. Snake's Revenge will not be played. Snake's Revenge was released in April of 1990 for the Nintendo Inter Entertainment System. It was published by Konami, but not produced by Kojima. Therefore, it is not in the spirit of the series, and it is an unofficial sequel to Metal Gear 1, which was replaced by a Kojima-produced Metal Gear 2 at a later point. So this game kind of doesn't exist. And in fact, cute little side note, somebody brought a copy of Snake's Revenge to Hideo Kojima at some meet and greet and asked him to sign it, Hideo Kojima threw it away. Metal Gear Solid VR missions. We played a little bit of it last night for the New Year's Eve stream. Uh, it's released October 21st of 1999 for the PS1. It's a non-story containing what I call a pacification entry. Uh, it lands between Metal Gear Solid 1 and Metal Gear Solid 2 which, if you recall, Metal Gear Solid 1 is a PlayStation 1 title, Metal Gear Solid 2 is a PlayStation 2 title. It is advertised as containing over 300 virtual reality missions, which simp simply means combat puzzles on wireframe levels. Uh, this game is most likely a release in response to Metal Gear Solid 2 being scrapped and reproduced on the PlayStation 2 because we were transitioning from the PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2. So it is believed that Metal Gear Solid 2 was in development for PS1, and the PS2 got announced, and Kojima did not want to produce a game for the last-gen system, so he scrapped production and started over on the PlayStation 2, and when he did, he had a lot of leftover elements, and I think it got makeshift into a game, and that is what is VR. Uh, we then have Ghost Babble, which was, uh, let's be real frank, it was a shield title to the handheld. Konami was trying to create a presence on handheld systems in America, and this was one of those titles. It's an attempt to create uh, the same kind of presence they have in Japan with handheld systems in America, which just doesn't work because we all mostly drive our own cars instead of pub, uh, mass transit, which is the reason why handhelds are so successful in Japan. Uh, Ghost Babble is a pseudo-retelling of Metal Gear Solid 1, uh, and therefore we miss no content. Uh, we then have... Uh, Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops Plus. This is a standalone expansion to Portable Ops, which we will be playing. And the standalone expansion only contains multiplayer and online content. We won't be missing anything there. Then we do have the Metal Gear Solid 4 database. This is something that's not a game that I can play. This is a database that we will actually be using. Um, it's a neat little application that you're able to download on the PlayStation 3. Uh, it came out June 19th, 2008, shortly after the release of Metal Gear Solid 4, and it contains all in-game lore in an encyclopedic fashion within this database. What is very cool about it is you cannot access any of the Metal Gear Solid 4 related lore until the database is able to read a game complete save file on your system. This actually stops you from spoiling things for yourself. But as I've said before, the Metal Gear storyline is so intensely complex that people, if they tell you they understood the storyline the first time they played through, they're an idiot and they're a liar. Or both. Bottom line, it took me three playthroughs to even get a general grasp of what the fuck is going on with this series. And the database is a fantastic way to fill in a lot of holes you're going to have. We'll be using it to get into de deeper detail and explain things. Lastly on here is the Metal Gear Solid Legacy Collection. This thing is fantastic. It came out July 9th of 2013 for the PlayStation 3. If you're interested in playing or experiencing this Metal Gear series for yourself with your hands on the controller, this is the way to do it. It's a two disc collection containing eight games, two videos, and an art booklet. The first disc in there is Metal Gear Solid 4 in its entirety. The second disc contains Metal Gear Solid 2, and Peace Walker remade in HD fashion. This is important because in this legacy collection as well as an HD collection that was released I think two years prior, this is the first time that Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker is playable on a console, not on the PSP. We then have Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 versions of this game are again the substance and subsistence titles and have improved gameplay and cameras. 
Interesting enough, the Metal Gear Solid 3 version that is in this does contain Metal Gear 1 and 2, which were originally MSX or NES title releases. The collection also comes with two redemption codes for Metal Gear Solid 1 and Metal Gear Solid VR missions for, through the PSN network. And then, of course, there is the art book that I mentioned before. That covers the honorable mentions of this series. These will be the games that we won't be playing in detail uh, as they are not part of the main story. So, to the real meat and potatoes of what makes this series this series, I have to explain to you the legend himself, Hideo Kojima. The mind behind Metal Gear. If you're gonna talk Metal Gear, you have to talk Kojima. With most video games, Gamers could care less about who directed or produced the title, which is not unlike with movies, but sometimes comes along an individual with such amazing creativity, a fan has to stop and ask themselves, who the hell made this? And not unlike movies again, I'm looking at you Quentin Tarantino, this has happened in the gaming industry. Hojima is video games Tarantino. I mean, it helps that he blasts his name all over his games to make damn sure you know that he made it, but still. This man was born in 1963. Hideo was the son of a pharmacist named Kingo Kojima. His father had a love for movies, but was a strong appreciation for soldiers, coupled with a disgust for war. It is clear these aspects made a very relevant impact on young Hideo, as they are seen throughout all of his works. Sadly, he lost his father at the age of 13. This was followed by a series of moves around Japan with his family. During this time, Kojima notes that he was very much a latchkey kid often coming home to an empty home after school, and to com combat the loneliness, he would watch television. Though his appreciation and love for TV and movies just grew fonder. This is a trait that he has with him today as he states when entering hotels while on business trips, the first thing he'll do is turn on the TV. We have fast forwarded to his college years. Kojima has initial aspirations of becoming a film director, but quickly surprises his colleagues in his fourth year of college when he announces he'll be joining the gaming industry, which is not a very large industry at the time. After some failed attempts to break in, he gets a job finally with Konami's MSX home computer division in 1986. His first works is on a game called Penguin Adventure. He's an assistant director on this game and doesn't actually have any creative control. After this, though, he does attempt to develop a title, Lost World, which is canceled by the Konami bigwigs in 1986. At this point, Koja Konami, or Kojima rather, is considering to have a series of failures. But he is then handed a project from another colleague, and it's completely handed over to him, and this would turn into Metal Gear. We'll now discuss the development of Metal Gear, and once we've moved on to the next title, we'll continue the insight into the career of Hideo Kojima. This will be the tr approach for the rest of the series as well. So, the story of Kojima's career will continue. Metal Gear, released 1987 for the MSX. As previously mentioned, it was a project that was handed off in its infancy to Hideo Kojima. No title, story, or art was completed yet, just a concept, which was, a war game with heavy gunfire involved. This was to be designed for the MSX, which was a fairly popular home computer system at the time in Japan. The MSX was actually a concept developed by Microsoft in an attempt to modernize personal computers across the board. When Microsoft had their hands in the creation though, they were not the sole manufacturers of the MSX as versions of it were made by Sony, Pioneer, and Panasonic, or more. It would soon be realized that the hardware limitations of the MSX posed a challenge for Kojima. The number of on-screen bullets and enemies were severely restricted, causing a war game with heavy gunplay to not be possible. This caused a moment of pure innovation for Kojima, as he chose to focus the gameplay away from the firefights with the enemies to sneaking and voiding them entirely. Kojima found this inspiration from The Great Escape, a book accounting the true story of a mass escape of British and Commonwealth airmen from a German prison camp during World War II in 1944. The game is finished and launched on June 13th of 1987. The initial response to the game was a huge success. It had begun. Kojima had broken into the industry and started a legend. To market the game to the West, Konami authorized a port to the Nintendo Entertainment System, but this was not overseen by Kojima, and therefore the localization of the game led to terrible, non-comprehensive dialogue, not to mention drastic level design changes that took away from the heart of the game. 
This would not always be the case, though. On August 18, 2004, Konami re-released Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater under the subtitle of Subsistence, a practice that was seen once before with Metal Gear Solid 2. And within this version, players got access to a remade, polished, relocalized, and improved version of Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2, previously not available in the US, as part, and the best part, Kojima oversaw the redesign. With that being said, this will be the version we'll be playing, as is most correctly representing what Kojima had in mind, and is the best gameplay. Not to mention, it's probably the only version I can get my hand on. With that being the case, we are finished with the history lesson of Metal Gear. And that brings us to the actual game.